Welcome to the Manu Mission Podcast, the show dedicated to unshackling ourselves from the status quo. Here's your host, H. H. Morris. Wow, my friends, a lot is going on, and I'm kind of glad that I didn't have time to record this episode yesterday because I was going to do it on a completely different topic. But everything has pretty much just devolved over the last week with Trump's first week in office. And I wanted to talk about these things. Immigration, the executive orders, a Muslim Muslim ban, uh, the refere- refugee program, the what's going on with the wall, border taxes, tariffs, deregulation, spending, a lot of stuff has been going on. But before I speak about the policies themselves and all of those other things that I just outlined. I want to first preface it by talking to the left. All of the people that are now taking to the streets that are protesting, that we saw protest a week ago, exactly a week ago, in the Women's March, during the inauguration, all the people right now protesting at airports and uh, on Twitter, on social media, the mainstream media in general, as per usual, the left. All right? I want to ask them a few questions. So bear with me here. So I want to ask, where were you? Where were you when your candidate for president, Hillary Clinton, was standing next to her husband in the 90s when he and her mentor, Madeleine Albright, and stated a blockade, a s- sanctions on Iraq that cost the deaths of 500,000 children, Muslim children. Where were you? Where were you when, at the beginning of the Bush administration, the Bush administration actually inherited the policy of regime change in Iraq? And when he finally stated that, your candidate as a U.S. senator voted for the war and subsequently voted for every single bill to fund that war. The war that you constantly were in the the streets complaining and protesting against. Where were you? When did you bring up the fact that it was your candidate that was part and parcel of making that all of that possible? Where were you when your candidate as a Secretary of State, along with your president, Barack Obama, trained and armed insurgents in Syria that, ascend- that eventually ended up becoming ISIS and that are currently destroying that country in Syria that has created the this refugee problem that we see in Europe and in the United States. Where were you? I don't remember seeing you on the streets when that was happening. I don't remember seeing you on the streets protesting when your candidate, Hillary Clinton, was using the United States Air Force to support the insurgents against Gaddafi who ended up being sodomized and murdered on the streets and that country being turned over to Islamic fundamentalists and is now unstable and where kids and people, innocent Muslims, die because of that instability. Where were you when your president, Barack Obama, was arming the rest of the world by selling arm, more arms than any other president in history to countries like Saudi Arabia so that they could by, have a proxy war with Yemen where kids are, and innocent people are being killed in the, by the dozens every day. Where were you? I don't remember seeing you protesting out in the streets. Or I don't remember reading about it in the Huffington Post or on MSNBC, or on CNN? Where were you? Where were you when your candidate, 
basically turned over the country of Ukraine to literal Nazis, Nazi sympathizers. Not like you use to describe Trump, he's literally Hitler. These are actual Nazi sympathizers who now run the Ukraine for the sole purpose of having them having a regime that was more amenable to NATO. And let's go back real quick, speaking about NATO. Where were you when Bill Clinton takes over into the biggest peace possible in the world after the the essentially the collapse of the Soviet Union? And he decides to, instead of disband NATO, expand NATO. Crickets. You said nothing. And his sub, the subsequent expansion over Bush. Even then, you probably didn't even know it was happening. What about under Obama? Did he dismantle it? No. Caused more friction by taking over Ukraine. Turned the relationship between the U.S. and Russia into a very, very fractious one. And again, nothing. Where were you? When and when did have you complained about the fact when you complain about a Muslim va- ban, which is not really the case, and I'll go in that in a minute. But I'll tell you where there is a Muslim ban in a handful of countries, if not more, Muslim countries where you cannot go to those countries if you're an Israeli citizen. Have you? How, I haven't seen the protests outside of those em- embassies saying, "Hey, no, hey, no Jewish ban." I haven't seen it. I haven't heard you complain. I haven't heard you protest. I haven't heard you excoriating these countries. I haven't heard you excoriating the countries that throw gays off of buildings or do female genital mutilation. I haven't seen it. I haven't heard it. So I think, I hope you understand, my friends, that even in the in the times and in the instances that I disagree with anything that Trump might do, I hope you understand why, to me, the left's complaints, their protests, their crying, their harangues, their virtue signaling, their histrionics, mean absolutely nothing to me. All right? So I wanted to make that clear, that they have zero credibility in my eyes. And there's only a very few that I actually, you know, understand or at least respect enough to say, okay, I don't agree with you, but at least you're consistent. And, you know, those might be some some uh, journalists like Glenn Greenwald, let's say, who's been, again, he's a lefty, but he's at least been very consistent. He's, he, he's one of the few journalists out there that he has complained about all these things that I've, that I just outlined, I just listed out. And that's still complaining about the things that Donald Trump is doing now. But at least, hey, you know what? You're consistent, and at least you're 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 um, being intellectually honest. And it doesn't really matter who's in power at the time. You'll call it out as you see it. You know what? I respect that. I can have a conversation with someone like that. I cannot have a conversation with someone that suddenly stands up and is you know, waving their flag and saying, that's un-American, that's not like us, we're, we're better than that, because Trump is now doing something you don't like, where it's either an extension of what your team was doing when they were in power, or it's something that is analogous to something that they had already been doing for the past eight years, and I'm sorry, I call BS. Right, so I just wanted to get that out there, guys. Um, you know, sorry for the rant, but I wanted you to to know where I'm coming from because to me this is just absolute insanity. But let's look at the things that are happening. See what can we make of them? You know, what? Uh, let's try to put some things in perspective. And I don't, I don't subscribe to the whole approach of well, I can do it because they did it, right? So if Trump is doing something to me just because. Obama was doing the same thing doesn't mean that it's acceptable and that it's the right thing. On the contrary, I call I call people out 
um, on their bad policies on anything that might result in people having less freedom and things that I think that will result in either more problems, more friction, more instability, regardless of their team, regardless of red versus blue, Democrats, Republicans, liberal, conservative. All right. I only see things through the prism of freedom. All right. Well, at the same time, trying to be pragmatic enough to say, hey, I really wish that things would happen this way. Suddenly, everybody's hearts and minds and eyes are open to freedom. And suddenly, everybody is singing Kumbaya together. Right? That's not going to happen. Okay? So, uh, although I don't think that the existence of government, of the state, is a foregone conclusion and is a necessity for, um, for humans to exist and coexist, I know that that is very far from 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 us right now and that there's also some things that we have to take reality in reality's terms all right so i'm going to start here and i don't have these in any particular order as far as importance i just want to talk about the things that have transpired over the last week that everybody's talking about so let's start with the biggest one i guess um and that's only because as i'm recording this every the world seems to be coming apart at the seams with this and that's the immigration issue that and specifically the muslim ban now muslim ban again hashtag fake news right this is not a muslim ban it was basically a travel ban for i believe it was five uh, no seven countries i believe right now these countries were chosen by jay johnson and barack obama okay they're um, that administration had already come up with the, this list of countries that they said, hey, this is where we have the most uh, the most problems from, where the, these are the, the countries that pose the biggest risk, yada, yada, yada. Okay? So again, this is something that is a carryover from, from the Obama administration that just Trump decided to sign off on and say, yeah, we're going to ban travel from these places until we figure out what's going on. Now, as you guys have heard, and, and if you listen to my episode on immigration, I hope you have. If you haven't, you should go and listen to it. This, even if it works for now, it's still just a Band-Aid. You have to deal with the root cause. The root cause is the United States bombing these places. Okay, When people are being bombed, and even if you're killing terrorists with these bombs or with you know soldiers going in there directly... There's always going to be collateral damage. That collateral damage basically overrides your killing of those terrorists. Why? Because when you kill a kid, a, a child, a little baby, an innocent woman, an old man, the family members of those people who, you know, up until then might not have had any Id, ill will towards you, guess what? Now they hate you. Now they want you dead because... They're missing a husband or a wife or a child or a parent, right? So you're never going to be able to catch up. This is exponential. So if you're going to do a travel ban, if you're going to exclude people from certain parts of the world, specifically the parts of the world where you're technically at war with, I mean, I know that we can't call it war because there's no uh, declaration of war, but then again, Obama and Hillary never declared war on any of these places where they've been killing people. That doesn't mean there isn't a war. There is a war. So would it stand to reason that, hey, let's not bring in people? Again, this is this is government funded, a government funded program. This is not immigration. This is not, oh, I'm, I got uh, a job um, from IBM and they're going to sponsor me and I have a job lined up and I'm going to move my my family over and, you know, yada, yada, yada. No, that's not it. That's the government, the U.S. government bombs your, bombs the hell out of your city. You know, you, you, you don't have anything to eat. You are destitute. You're suffering. Now, the same country comes and says, hey, come over here. Come live with us. Does that seem smart? Now, again, the left doesn't complain about the fact that there are at least a handful of different countries in the Middle East, 
in the Arabian Peninsula, in the Gulf countries, that could take these people. These are wealthy countries. These are countries that share the same religion, the same language. And yet, where are the left when uh, when it comes to, hey, why isn't Saudi Arabia taking these people? Or Kuwait, or Qatar, or UAE, or Egypt, or Jordan, right? When they're neighbors. Where, where were they? they? You don't hear them complaining about that. It's the United States that needs to bring in people now, this is a new administration. They know what's going on. And they say, why are we bringing in people at our expense when these pe- when a lot of these people hate us, right? Now, again, to me, that is second, second not even second, tertiary, tertiary to the, the argument of stop bombing. And that's where I would criticize the people on the right as well and the uh, people that support Trump blindly, which is if you're going to say, hey, okay, good for you, Trump, for stopping these people to come in, you should be 10 times as loud and saying, okay, Trump, we get it. We shouldn't be importing people um, from countries that probably hate us with, with good reason, but stop bombing them. Please get out of there. Bring our boys home. Let them sort things out for themselves. And I'm not seeing that either. The only people that I'm hearing say anything close to that are other fellow libertarians. Um, but unfortunately, there's also a big contingent of, all, of fellow libertarians that are essentially just going by um, what the left is saying and just simply saying, oh, that's a uh, heartless. We can't be doing this and let people in and all and help. No, you can't have it both ways. You can't say. It's wrong to it's wrong to bomb other pe- other people in other countries because that turns them into terrorists that radicalizes them and say, but it's okay to bring them here and have us pay for it. You can't have it both ways, just like the right can't have it both ways and the left ha- can't ha- have it both ways. We need to be smart about this, so we need to be more vocal about about those about the real solutions. Okay. Now. Something that was big up until all of this blew up with the Muslim ban um, is the fact with the, the wall, right? He wants to build the wall, um, this beautiful, huge, pretty wall that he keeps telling us about. And now it turns out that there's some estimates that have been as high as $20 billion that it would cost to build this thing, all right? And now in preliminary talks with Mexico, he said, hey, before we even meet, we, you need to tell me that you're going to be willing to somehow pay for this wall. Of course, Mexico says, go screw yourself, and their meeting gets canceled. All right. Well, now it ter- turns out that most likely we, the taxpayers, are going to have to end up paying for that wall, and Trump is somehow going to find a way for Mexico to end up paying for it or to pay us back or whatnot. Now, one of the things that they have uh, bandied about was that we would put a tax on Mexican products coming back into the United States. Okay. Well, again, when you look at it from a pragmatic standpoint, you say, all right, well, there's all these people that are coming in here undocumented illegally against ICE. I'm saying illegal because, hey, I wouldn't like there to be a state, but there is one. And the country says, you can come in, just come in through here, right? Just like if you have a house and someone just jumps through your window, you say, no, one of your friends, like, yeah, you can come into my house. I invited you over, but why did you make a shoulder roll through my window or through my, you know, my, my back door? No, come in through the front door. That's what it's there for, right? So similarly, a country says, again, I wish there was no country, no government, no centralized um, uh, form of of uh, planning, but there is. So the, you know, that's the house. And they say, here's the door Come in through this door. And before you come in through here, we just want to know who you are. We want to know what your um, intentions are. We want to make sure that you're not blah, blah, blah. Okay. All right. Well, again, Band-Aid, a $25 billion Band-Aid, because what is the root cause? The root cause is one, the situation, I don't want to go into this too far because, again, all you need to do is listen to my immigration, um, my episode on immigration. You'll get all of this. But just to recap real quick, 
the real root of the problem is the poverty and instability in all of the, the problems that are going on in places like Mexico, Central America, and South America, right? So the American government doesn't have a lot to um, to do with that. They have very limited methods of, of, of helping with that. I mean, because, you know, they can't control directly the policies and the decisions that the politicians in those countries make. But you can deal with the incentives and what, you know, how you attract people. And the reality is that there's a lot of things that attract those people to the United States. In some cases, it might be the welfare state, although that's minimal. I think the people on the right make this a much bigger case than it really is because, again, when they come through, they don't qualify for the most part for a lot of benefits, for most benefits, okay? To the extent that they do are the ones where, you know, if they go to a hospital, to an ER, they have to be seen. If they go and apply to a school, they have to be accepted. I mean, that's not... um, peanuts guys That's, uh, that is a lot of money but it's not like they receive checks for for welfare or food stamps or that kind of stuff because at that point you do they do have to to vet you and that kind of stuff but but that is that is a factor the biggest factor is that in doing away w- with the welfare state then you would have the people that live in the country would have to work and if the people in the country would have to work and they were out there being productive and you have you liter you actually have full employment, not what we have right now. It's all the way that the government me- measures employment is a complete farce. But if you actually had everybody off their asses working and building things and being productive, then you would minimize the amount of of openings or types of jobs that would be that companies need to be filled, right? So then they'd be like, oh, why am I going to go to the U.S.? I'm not going to be able to find a job. There's nothing there. Everybody's working. Everything's everything's um, becoming more and more, you know, more and more uh, automated. Uh, these are all high-end jobs that I would need to know how to code. I would need to uh, be able to know how to um, do fabrication. I would need to know how I would need to be a doctor. I would need to be an engineer. I would need to be blah, 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 right? That wouldn't happen. And those people would have to stay in their in their countries, which would essentially work as a way to allow those countries to reach a tipping point. And whether it's through civil war, whether it's through votes, whether it's whatever, to change the circumstances in their own country. Okay, There is nothing compassionate about letting hordes of millions of people through to the United States when the reality is that there are a hundred times as many people back in the home countries suffering even more and you just allowing those uh, you know those million people into your country you pat yourself on the back and oh we're so compassionate we're so we have such big hearts well guess what that did absolutely nothing as a matter of fact it actually retarded the the effect or retarded the amount of time that's going to take for the country of origin to get their stuff together because now they have a million less people that they have to worry about. They don't have to worry about paying the, their health care. They don't have to feed them. They don't have to anything, right? They don't have to worry about them uh, taking to, to to arms or whatever, right? But again, I went through all of this in the immigration uh, episode, so I would refer you to that. Now, the the in terms of the economy, and again, we go back to this tariffs thing where we say, hey, you know, we're going to put a tariff on, on things coming in from this country or that country, or if you leave, you're going to have to pay this or that. Okay. Not going to get into the specifics because all of that is out there for you to look at. I just want to talk about the the principles and the, um, the, the theories here at play. I want you to think about this. I import everything that I have and that I need. Okay. Let me repeat that. Everything that I have that I have in my house right now where I'm recording this, I have imported. Do you understand what that means? Now, forget about where those things were made. The fact is that if I have an empty house and I sit here and I need things, a computer, chairs, desks, um, a dining room table, uh, pictures on the wall, uh, appliances, all of those things are outside of that house, of my house. I need to import them 
because I want them or need them. So everything needs to be imported. And that is if you take anything away from this section, from this part of the conversation on the economy, is that we import everything. Now, making things that I bring in to my house more expensive does not help me in the least. If anything, it actually makes me poorer because I have less money to spend on other things, which means that you have now negatively impacted my quality of life because I could have had more. Does that make sense? So by simply saying, you know what, that's unfair, your products are too cheap, we're not going to let them in, you're only hurting the consumer. Okay? You're basically... Um, snubbing your nose to spite your face because what's going to happen is now the things that I want or need are going to, going to cost more, right? Because I have to buy something that just has to be made in America, let's say. Now, I have absolutely no problem with buying things that are made in America. If the thing that's being made is made in America and that is the best quality for the best price, shit, I don't care where, where it's, it was made. I, I, I buy it. You know, regardless, that's what I want. It's the thing that gives me the best service, the best quality, at the best price. That's what I get. Now, if in the U.S., that can't be done for whatever reason. You know, I understand the issues of um, currency manipulation and the fact that there's poor countries that can pay their workers, you know, $2 a day, which you can't get away with here, whatever. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter because ultimately... I'm going to buy the cheap product, okay? That's going to free me up, free up my money to be able to buy other things. And some of those things are going to be in the U.S., which are going to be the services tool, which are being able to go to restaurants more often, to be able to go on trips here, go to Disneyland, or to pay for the school uh, that I want my kids to attend, or all of that stuff, okay? Now, at the same time, When I'm buying these things from places, whether it's China, whether it's India, Vietnam, Mexico, or elsewhere, me buying those things makes them richer too, which means that there's a bigger opportunity or a greater likelihood of them finally being able to buy the things that we make over here, right? Just a few months ago, I was visiting Vancouver with uh, with my wife, we went there for business. We're meeting with one of our suppliers for our business, and I was amazed about the the amount of Chinese people in Vancouver. Now you wouldn't have seen this 10, 15 years ago, twenty or uh, even um, of course even less, right? And the only reason why now you see so many Chinese people traveling, spending money, over a billion people that now have the the the, the capacity the ability, and the wealth to travel to other parts of the world and spend their money there. And the only reason why that's even possible is because they make cheap stuff that everybody else buys. That's good for everybody. Okay? So this thing about the deficit, not def- sorry, not deficit spending, we have a, this trade imbalance means nothing because you have to take everything into consideration. And they've been, um, uh, I've seen a lot of Libertarians lately give the example of, hey, I have a 100% trade imbalance with my grocery store. What does that mean? I go in there. They never buy anything from me. I, I'm 100% of the time I walk into the grocery store, I buy their stuff, and they buy none of mine. That doesn't mean anything, right? Because what they do with the money that I spend there grows their company, goes to pay the the salaries of their employees who then end up spending it in different things. And somehow at some point, some of it might come back to me, but it's a greater likelihood that that's going to happen the more money that that grocery store makes. So the more money that China makes or India makes, the greater the likelihood of them being able to visit the United States and again, go to Disneyland and to stay at a, at a, at a Marriott hotel and to go to restaurants and spend that and to buy things that are made in America and yada, yada, yada. So if they stay poor, how are they going to buy any of our stuff? How are they ever going to become tourists and come travel and spend their, their hard earned money and, and, and get everybody wealthier? 
and for everybody to have a, a higher standard of living, right? So I get kind of the reaction Okay, I understand where this is coming from because then you also come to the point like, well, then what do we do with um, with all of these jobs and these companies going overseas? And again, remember, the tariff is a band aid. What are the the um, the root causes? Taxes. Make it so that everybody wants to do business in the United States. If everybody wants to do business in the United States. If countries don't have, sorry, companies don't have to pay the almost the highest corporate rate in the developed world here in the United States, then they're going to hire more people. They're going to pay people more. They're going to be able to compete even more with other countries, whether they um, make cheaper stuff or not, right? But that money is going to flow a lot more. It's going to go a lot further. But at the same time, you also have to cut government spending. We say, well, what does government spending have to do? Remember, the bigger the the, the government, the, the more that the government does, the more that it crowds out the private sector. Because if it's the the government that's that's, you know, building a bridge or that's uh, you know, building all this quote infrastructure, doing all of these things, they're taking away people that could be in the private sector doing other things that are more productive that are actually companies that are actually responding to market, you know, inputs. They're saying, "Hey, we need more people. We need to 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 build more X, right? Well, we need more people that know how to do X. So, oh, we don't have them. Where are they? Well, they're all working for the government doing whatever the government thinks is the right thing, which half the time, if not more often, ends up being something that wasn't needed in the first place. But they don't have any inputs that way. They just they do it all by fiat. Oh, we just want to employ more people. This is a, a works program, so we'll just have them digging holes with spoons all day and just pay them. And we can say, hey, you know, we're at full uh, full employment. Everybody's employed, right? So, again, we need to get out of this idea that you know, starting trade wars and putting tariffs on things. But I'll tell you what, I would be okay with t- with tariffs if they said we're going to imp- impose tariff tariffs on everything from every other country, right? I would be okay with that if they did away with taxes. If the, if the country said, we're going to run the government only with the tariffs that we, that we collect from imports, that would be better than, think, than how it is right now. As a matter of fact, that's, that's exactly how the, the government ran when it was founded. There were no taxes. There was no income tax. Everything was tariffs and excise taxes. And you know what? That would probably be better. And then again, because then whatever tariffs they impose on on products, if I can keep my entire paycheck, it might still be cheap uh, cheaper for me to buy that product from China, even though there's a you know 50% tariff on it anyway, right? It might still be cheaper than the American product. Again, provided that it's of the at least equal or or, or better quality. Again, that that's always has to be the case. For instance, there's some things that um, that I never buy from other countries that I always buy American, and that's just because I have you know experience in saying, oh, this thing breaks after a few times that you use it, or it just stops working, or um, you know whatever. I have to end up buying three of them um, in the long run. So okay, fine, I'll just you know suck it up and I'll buy the American version, which is you know five times more expensive, but at least you buy it once and you're good to go. Yeah, that exists too. And that's fine. And now, ironically, it's the left that have suddenly become free market, um, you know, laissez-faire. Oh, you're, this is just going to make it more, more expensive for people. These are the people that have basically been decrying places like Walmart and Target and all these places that buy cheap Chinese stuff so that poor people can afford stuff. Poor people in the United States have the best quality of life than poor people in every other part of the world. So no matter what they tell you about, oh, well, this country has um, universal health care or they have all of this stuff, right? The welfare state, nanny state, cradle, grave, all that kind of stuff. Do you know that Sweden and Germany, places like that, have an actually um, lower per 
capita uh, average income, right? So come on. The average income in those in those places are the average income of you know Mississippi and some of the 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 poorest states in the in in the country in the United States. So again, everybody's kind of going cuckoo for cocoa puffs here. So the left is now suddenly like well, I've talked about this before. Now they're the ones talking about secession. They're the ones talking about holding back taxes. They're the ones talking about uh, doing away with tariffs and that that only increases the price of things and whatever. When and then what you know what was Bernie Sanders talking about when they were all going goo goo gaga over Bernie Sa- Sanders? He was talking about similar things. He was he was talking about the same things about the workers and that we can't compete. It's not fair because of other countries and the 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 companies leaving the country and blah blah blah. It was the same crap, right? So they they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. All right. So this is just the beginning, folks. This is going to get even more interesting. It's going to be, get even crazier. Um, I don't even know what to make of it. So I'm just going along for the ride, and I'm going to try to make as much sense of it as I can and share you know my views with you, my perspective, and hopefully... Uh, again, I think we can do a lot of good here because this is the opportunity. These are the death throes of the current system, of the current paradigm, as much as I hate to use that term. Okay, the, I think we're going right through the, the eye of the storm, if you will, of what's going to end up being the next societal evolution. Now, I don't think that it's going to be anarcho-capitalism or that it's going to be a Rothbardian, uh, you know, utopia or all those things, the things that philosophically I agree with and that I think are going to eventually be uh, kind of the, the highest order of, of, uh, of society and of, of free uh, societies and communities. But I think the next step is upon us. And that next step is going to be us realizing that we are at an impasse, and at the very least, we need to break up. We need to let each other go. Let everybody do what they want to do. Let California secede. Let them create the Democratic People's Republic of California. Let let this go, this entire globe be dotted with countries the size of Singapore, where everybody just does their own thing where there's a country that is all gay people, a country that it's all Christians, or a country that is all... Um, transgender, a country that is all, uh, you know, capitalists, a country that is all Muslims, a country that is all that, whatever. And these places dotted and being able to be free. And guess what? Let's all complete, compete. Let's all see what system works. But for crying out loud, people, let's stop forcing each other to, f- to live the way that we live, the way we want everybody else to live. That's that has to stop. And I think we're seeing just the beginnings of this when people are finally going to be so fed up that they're just going to say, fine, I quit. Let's go our separate ways. Let's set up our own systems. Let's set up our own communities, our own societies. And let's just see what works. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited to see that happen. So we'll see. But I know there'll be a lot more things to talk about next week. So I hope to talk to you then. All right. Take care. If you want to know how you can help me keep the show going, or if you have a question, comment, or recommendation, you can contact me directly or through social media. Find out how to do all that by visiting manumission.com.